Hello YouTube, welcome to the Educated Barbarian, focused on the Enchiridion. And I believe that today is episode 3 or 4, most likely episode 3. And we're going to go back into the study of the message by Epictetus, which summarizes the Stoic mindset and Stoic ideals fairly well. If you would have your children and your wife and your friends to live forever, you are silly. For you would have the things which are not in your power to be in your power, and the things which belong to others to be yours. So this works on three levels, in my opinion. First off, it works on the, the, the bi-dimensional uh, context of the control that you have over things in your life, because this is a perfect example of something that is not only outside of your control, but that even if it were in your control, would still technically not be up for you to choose. Meaning that even if you had the power to grant immortality to someone, doing it technically would be an act that could be seen as a potential fault. Because it's not necessarily a good thing to live forever. Unless you also granted yourself with immortality and every single person that the person that you chose with that power as well. And therefore, it's not something that is reasonable at all. And the problem doesn't really arise anyways because you don't have that power. So it's, it's both a concern that is not anchored in reality on top of being something that would be bad even if it were. And that I find is true with most fantasies. Most of the, the ideas that people have in their heads of, oh, if I could do this, I would. Most of the time, those wild fantasies would result in catastrophes. And there's actually a lot of uh, very good pieces of literature on the topic. One that is relevant to the channel is Berserk, the manga Berserk. And I'm not going to spoil too much, but in the manga, you can obtain a large amount of power if you sacrifice someone that is very close to you that you love. And you might think that it's strange because it's the opposite of immortality, but in reality it isn't. Because when you grant someone immortality, you don't do it for them, you do it for you. You do it because you want to keep them around forever for your own enjoyment, because you love them. Not because you want them to be able to just exist as a perpetual being. And in a sense, you sacrifice them when you do that. And by doing so, you acquire power. You acquire the power to have them forever. But it's not reasonable at all. And the last thing, and it's sort of the, the subtext of all of this, it's the third uh, addition to make to that that Epictetus didn't add, but that Marcus Aurelius uh, discussed at some point. Immortality, as I just said, is a curse. It's not something that you, you, that you should desire. People who desire immortality showcase a certain type of childishness. They refuse that they will eventually be subjected to death. And therefore, immortality is not for the sake of living forever. It's for the sake of never dying. But in a way, by refusing to die, you also refuse to live. Because it's the very finite amount of time that we have on Earth that is giving it all its flavor and importance. And you see that a lot in mythology. You see a lot of characters that are immortal that get tortured by that very thought. The only characters, canonically, that can be immortal and maintain a certain degree of sanity are gods. And that is by, uh, it's by um, design. The author, and just for hundreds and, and thousands of years, the authors have made that distinction. Because a god is something that was born to be perpetual even though that is up to discussion, but it is in its DNA to be something infinite. Humans don't have that capacity. This is why gods are gods and humans are humans. These are two different entities altogether. For you would have badness not be badness, but something else. So this is an, an inversion of value. It's trying to take something that is seen as negative and turn it into a positive. It's turning death into immortality. But the problem here is that, and again, he doesn't say it, I'm just reading through the lines, is that death is not a bad thing. We attribute a negative connotation to death because it's the end of things and humans are terrified of ends. We see it as the end of productivity and therefore it is seen as bad. But it truly isn't. And immortality also isn't good. It's the exact opposite in reality. And therefore, it is, in a sense, have badness not be badness. But it's in two ways at once, right? Because 
it's not just that you're trying to dodge death. You're dodging death by applying a solution that is even worse. Because when you grant immortality to someone, you effectively kill them in that very instant. It's like providing someone with all of their needs at once. You spoil them is the reason why you have that verb, to spoil. What does that mean? When you spoil someone, you remove their uh, emphasis and their incentive for life. I just provided you with all you need to survive. So why should you even live to start with? You have everything you need. It's the reason why riches are something that shouldn't be desired for their own possession. The work that leads you to the riches is interesting, but the riches in themselves aren't. And it's the reason why uh, systems of massive gains like the lottery tend to make people very miserable because it just afflicts them with a massive amount of money they didn't really earn or work for and it tends to make your life worse as a it's a net negative at the end of the day he is the master of every man who has the power over the things which another person wishes or does not wish the power to confer them on him or to take them away whoever then wishes to be free let him neither wish for anything nor avoid anything which depends on others. If he does not observe this rule, he must be a slave. So by this definition, a large portion of the human population on earth today are slaves. And I would actually agree with that. Meaning that there are two, there are two, there's two types of slavery. There's the historical kind, which puts you under the status of the slave, where you are actively enslaved. You are now working for someone else and your will has been subdued. But that very definition also applies to people who are manipulated, be it by the media or by external forces. At the end of the day, they're also not working for their own benefit. They also don't think for themselves and they cannot express themselves freely. So what exactly separates them from a slave? Well, at this point, the only difference is that their treatment is a little bit better and their status is a little bit more privileged for now. But you will see that the transition into full-on slaves is going to slowly happen. It's something that has been happening for hundreds of years. The human condition is slowly being chipped away at uh, for a very simple reason. is because if they are slaves, they also are slave masters. There are people who are above the crowd that have perfectly understood that humans have some subservient mechanisms in their spirit that if manipulated properly can lead even the most independent of souls to become sheep that are extremely easy to manipulate and just use as farm animals to an extent. But that has been discussed in many texts. And so that paragraph in and of itself is interesting because the master of every man is in reality the one that masters himself. And that is true across the board. You will find that a lot of people believe that true mastery comes into the control of others. But that is just partial mastery. Because if you actually master the self, then the very concept of mastering others wouldn't matter anymore because you would have control over the self, which is the most and actually the only important thing that you should control in this life. And if every single person was a master of themselves, I do believe that we could reach a very high level of vibration in the world, if that makes sense. We would reach what some would call a utopia because we would all be our own masters. And you see also that this power rests also on the ability to confer them on him or to take them away. Meaning that the one that is not preoccupied with the, 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 uh, the obsessions of the mass also ends up being the one that in reality is the most free compared to them and has the more of an ability to obtain them if they want. Uh, it's a concept that is sort of related to the laws of attraction in a sense, meaning that if you end up desiring something so much that you become devoured by the very concept and thought, there is a chance that this thing is going to become your master. And therefore, you have now lost the plot because that thing is now guiding your life. And you thought at the start that by chasing that thing, your life would become better, but it's the exact opposite. Uh, a good example for that is people who are extremely needy for love and they constantly seek love. These people tend to have a very tough time securing love because love tends to resent neediness. And the exact opposite would be someone who is not on the market, who is not actively looking, who's going to have a much stronger chance of finding it. There are 
multiple mechanisms for that, but across the board, I have found that it applies to almost every single aspect of life. If you become a slave to something, then th that pursuit of the very thing is going to be very complicated in the future. You want to remain independent. It's the same for lifting. I was personally at a point a slave to lifting where I was forcing myself to lift. I wasn't necessarily enjoying it. I felt obligated. I felt anxious if I missed a day. And until I managed to free myself from that and I realized that I was the one in control, uh, it was a really tough time to the point where I think that most of my lack of progress, both physically and spiritually, were linked to that. And it might be counterintuitive. You might think, okay, so you, you severed the, the, the link between you and that practice. You are now less obsessed and, less, and, and yet you make better gains. Yes, because I'm finally able to see the situation for what it is. I see freely and I, therefore I'm free. And it's something that you should apply in your life. If you can, based on that paragraph, think back to something that has this place in your life, then keep in mind that rethinking that relationship might make a big difference in the long run. Remember that in life, you ought to behave as at a banquet. Banquet, this is really tough to pronounce for me. Like a buffet, in a sense. Suppose that something is carried round and is opposite to you. Stretch out your hand and take a portion with decency. Suppose that it passes by you. Do not detain it. Suppose that it has not yet come to you, do not send your desire forward to it, but wait till it is opposite to you. So again, that paragraph follows the previous one, like back to back, and it's the perfect continuation of what I just said. The relationship with desire. How does the Stoic deal with desire? Does he completely relinquish it? No, because that would mean uh, abandoning a part and a portion of humanity. And Stoicism is extremely practical in the sense that it is not a type of mortification. It truly isn't. Being a Stoic is not difficult in the sense that it's not something that is going to disallow you to enjoy the finest things in life. You can still have fun. You can still have pleasure, pleasures in this life, but you're going to have them on your own agenda and you're going to be in control always. That's what it means here. So the, the, the metaphor of the, the food and the banquet is that having desires is fine, but trying desperately to grab something that is out of reach, that you know is out of reach, even with a lot of efforts, is just silly because it's just going to make you miserable. And you would find that if you exercise patience, at some point, this thing is going to be much more available. It's going to come near you. And that is what I explained with the desire. Things that you want can sometimes reject you if you go after them guns blazing and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't desire things and think about things but it has to be within the limits of reason but if you take none of the things which are said before you and even despise them then you will be not only a fellow banqueter with the gods but also a partner with them in power again the distinction between humans and gods so what does it mean here? This is extremely important. It caught me by surprise uh, the first time I read it because I, was, I couldn't understand what he meant to, to a certain point. So the first thing is that gods are beings without desire. Why would gods have no desires? Well, it's because they have everything. Think back to what I just said. When you spoil someone, you remove the incentive to have desires and therefore this person is dead because they have nothing to strive for. So in a sense, that is the state of godhood. It's what a god is. They are without desires. Why? Because a god is something that can create anything. And therefore, there is no desire to be had when you can literally create anything you want. And yet, it's always interesting to think back, especially when you look back at the old gods, like the Greek gods, the Roman gods, the Nordic gods. These gods had desires. They still remained partially human. And I think it's the big uh, reason why we now have monotheist religions where God is that entity that is so disconnected and so apersonal 
is because that last part of humanity was completely removed. And God is now an entity that is much closer to an extraterrestrial being than an actual human. And that is, to me, the biggest distinction, by the way, between polytheist and monotheist religions. It's that. It's the nature of God. What is God? Uh, the gods of the, uh, the ancient Greece, for example, were much easier to represent. Again, if you think of the God of Christianity, the way that he is represented, okay, there's a canonical representation of God, but is it as detailed and as furnished based on literature as the old God? No, absolutely not. Like the representation that we make of Zeus, for example, is pretty much 100% accurate. We know he was supposed to look like that. That tells you something. It tells you that this God was supposed to be representable and the new gods aren't. They're supposed to remain a little bit mysterious in a sense. Make of that what you will. I always found that it's an extremely interesting point when it comes to theology. So that's gods, again, as I said. If you manage to reject desires altogether, you will be like a god, right? And the question now is, is that a state that you would want to reach? I personally am not, a, not at a point in my life where I'm seeking that. But you could liken that to enlightenment. A lot of enlightenment is just the renouncing of anything earthly. So any desires get completely rejected and you're supposed to get enlightened at this point. I do believe that the concept of nirvana is based on that very idea. Right now, as a 27-year-old, it's not something that appeals to me. But I'm trying to walk my way there by severing some of the desires I have in my life. So some of the things that I find are not necessary, I just reject, right? I'm, at, I'm not reaching out to them anymore. And we'll see where it gets me. Maybe I'll get to a point where I'm able to just be uh, completely removed from the shackles of desire. But I can tell you that I am far from that. And most likely you are as well because we're imperfect humans. But that's fine because we're walking towards it. When you see a person weeping in sorrow, either when a child goes abroad or when he is dead, or when the man has lost his property, take care that the appearance do not hurry you away with it, as if he were suffering in external things. Straight away, make a distinction in your own mind and be in readiness. Tell to yourself, it is not that which has happened that afflicts this man, for it does not afflict another but it is the opinion about this thing which afflicts the man. So far as words, then, do not be un unwilling to show him sympathy, and even if it happens so, to lament with him. But take care that you do not lament internally also. So, very interesting, and uh, again, a balancing of the Stoic mind and of the Stoic ideology. A lot of, quote-unquote, Stoics uh, like to be unfeeling, meaning that when they see someone who's struggling through no fault of their own, they're going to just say, oh, stop suffering. That is not stoicism. That is being a jerk. And on top of that, it, it goes directly against stoicism because the reason why you want the person to stop is not to better themselves. It's because seeing them miserable makes you feel uh, like, in a sense, offended because they're not, they're not following your own philosophical doctrine. And that is bad. The Stoic doesn't push his ideas onto others. He doesn't have to. Stoicism is a very attractive way of living your life. You don't have to be a proselyst about it at all. Therefore, you should be sharing the person's sorrow, at least in appearance, to make them feel better. Hope that in the future they will actually be able to remark and reflect on the actual source of the sadness, which is themselves and not the actual action. And you yourself stay re resolute in your belief that this is true. This is to be. What caused the sorrow is not the event. It's the way the event was perceived. When a raven has croaked inauspiciously, let not the appearance hurry you away with it. But straight away, make a distinction in your mind and say, none of these things is signified to me. But to me, all significations are auspicious if I choose. For whatever of these things results, it is in my power to derive benefit from it. So the, ra the raven uh, uh, synonym and metaphor here for people who know the, like, the symbolics attached to it, ravens were attached to bad omens. 
So hearing a, a raven croak was a bad omen. Bad omens are a bit silly and all over the place. In certain countries, seeing a black cat is a bad omen, seeing a black dog is a bad omen, etc., etc. I've always loved ravens, personally, I like them to hear them croak. I have a few of them in my garden that are like, they're not domesticated at all, but they play tricks around the yard. It's, it's fun to watch. Um, but back in the days, it wasn't the case at all. Because, of course, if you want to go back again to the symbolic of the reason why this bird in particular is associated with that, one, it's because they're extremely intelligent, and therefore, we associate malice with their intelligence, and two, they are often attracted by corpses, because they are, uh, what is the term? En français, on dit des charognards. I'm not sure in English, but they eat corpses, and therefore, they are associated with death. And yet here, Epictetus tells you that this is silly, of course, but that on top of being silly, you could also choose to make a good omen out of a bad omen. You could tell yourself, okay, my, my, my fellow citizens, co-citizens say and believe that hearing a raven croak is a bad omen. I will, believe to, I will choose to believe that it is a good omen. And by believing it that way, it's going to become a good omen. You decide what the word means. Um, symbolism as applied to the word via numerology or just, I don't know, astrology or the science of the stars, etc., etc. All of these things that are supposed to give you clear signs of good or bad things to happen could all be interpreted positively. You could always choose to believe that it's positive. And by believing that, it's going to be positive because you're going to have a positive mindset and approach in your life. So that's always what you should be doing. Always think about things positively. In my family, for example, the number 13 is not seen as a bad omen. It's not a bad number or an unlucky number. It's a lucky number. Why? Because my grandma was born on a 13. And just like that, we took a tradition and we switched it on its head. And now every member of the family likes the 13 of the month. It's a, a very lucky and happy day for us. You can do that with anything or everything because cultural bonds and just... Um, Myths, in a sense, and legends were made by people's belief. So if you believe the opposite, you're going to actually reshape the belief. You can't be invincible if you enter into no contest in which it is not in your power to conquer. Take care, then, when you observe a man honored before others or possessed of great power or highly esteemed for any reason, not to suppose him happy, and be not carried away by the appearance. For if the nature of the good is in our power, neither envy or jealousy will have a place in us. Okay. The first thing is very important and very interesting because it applies beautifully to lifting. I personally never fail a lift. And the reason why I never fail a lift is because I never pick a lift with a weight and a rep range that is going to lead me to fail. I pick my battles. I pick the battles that I know I will win and I only stick to these battles. I never put myself in a situation where I can lose, and therefore I never lose. This is how you should think about your training and your life in general. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't take risks, but you should take calculated risks. The second the risk is outside of your control is the moment where your destiny can slip away from your hands because you yourself gave authorization to destiny to slip. It was because of you. So be very careful when you do those, those, uh, those decisions. And when it comes to looking at men who are above us in terms of status, you need to not infer emotions. You need to not look at your jealousy and envy and think, okay, because I am so envious of him, this must mean he's superior by default. No, you have just imagined him as, in a sense, a representation of what you desire the most. And that leads to him, you detesting him. But by you detesting him, you now detest what you desire the most. This is classic. It's called celebrity worship or hero worship. It's looking up at someone who is a role model for you, resenting them because they have things you don't have, and in a weird, vicious, backwards way, starting to resent the very things that you love that leads to you resenting yourself at the end. This is extremely prevalent, especially in teenagers extremely dangerous mindset to have. This can destroy your life. So be very wary. And I just love that Epictetus just drops that in the middle of the paragraph with no further explanation. 
as he says, if the nature of the good is in our power, neither envy nor jealousy will have a place in us. The nature of good is your ability to reach that level that you so desire. If you stay true and pure in that endeavor, you will never have to feel jealous of the person because you know you're going to have what they have eventually what you want. The man who knows he will never get there is the jealous one because he is, in a sense, self-sabotaging. He knows he'll never get it, so he hates on it, he hates himself, and he ends up living a miserable, miserable life. And that is it for today. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.